thinks you are mad. Okay. And so we have to get instructions from Delhi to tell the ambassador to give a visa. But he thinks that this woman will come into India and disappear. And I said, no, she's going to be here for six months. And you want to make a solar engineer out of this electric woman? Yes. <laughs> Too much for that. In fact, four women from Bolivia, I don't know if you saw, anyone speaks French? Uh, Spanish? Yo. You spoke to her? No, I did to the uh, lady from Cuba. Not from Bolivia? I didn't get to her. The Bolivians were on a break, yeah. uh, so we didn't meet them. Oh. This woman came alone from Bolivia. And the and three of them, uh, the other three were sent back from Sao Paulo because they couldn't believe that she would. So they said, no, not possible, so we're going to send you back. This is so, <laughs> it was a big diplomatic crisis. Three women were sent back. The Indian government had given them money for it. They didn't believe. Wow. So we have big problem with our own embassy and high commission. How do we convince them that these people are really going for a training which is sponsored by the government of India. Hmm. So we have a good um, partnership with the UN Women. UN Women, um, Michelle Bachelet used to look after the UN Women in uh, New York. She loved it. She loved every inch of it. And she would come and she came, to, she came to India and saw these women and, oh, one of our favorite programs. She gave us a lot of money for that. In Pacific as well as in Africa. Uh, the regime change hasn't affected your program. Might, might not. We're too small. Maybe it will it'll come to us. I have no idea. No idea. Everyone is in a state of uncertainty, including the Prime Minister. <laughs> well, that is good for us. <laughs> good and bad. We have no idea. But definitely, uh, <coughs> he's not paying enough respect to Gandhi. He's doing some odd things about Mahatma Gandhi. So we'll wait and see what he has to do and what his underlings are doing. His underlings are more dangerous than him. Yeah. So I don't know what he's doing. I'm sure you'll hear more about it from Aruna. <coughs> I have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm connected with the organization in Kolapur. Mm -hmm. This is for women. Empowering women. Kolapur. Kolapur. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's in the village near Kolapur. And uh, I was wondering if some more women from there could be selected to come and train there. We have a process. First of all, it has to be a non electrified village. It has to be a village away from the conventional grid. <coughs> it has to be a, about a hundred houses, which are non-electrified. There shouldn't be any generator sets there, generate, uh, diesel generating sets there, or any panels there. So we want uh, the village to be absolutely untouched and unreached. Uh, and we have to go to the community and find out how much they are already paying for kerosene, candles, torch batteries and diesel. Mm -hmm. If sometimes you see that they are paying about 100 and 150 rupees a month, and if solar should come, would they pay 150 rupees a month for solar? That is, has to be decided by the community. The community also has to form a committee to collect the money if and when the solar does come. And then the community selects the grandmothers. So today, you only saw the international side. Mm -hmm. In the national side, after lunch, <coughs> you see tribal women from Jharkhand, from Orissa, from uh, Bihar, from all sorts of places in India. And they're really, truly tribal indigenous grandmothers who don't know how to read and write. So these women are the ones who are going to be the solar engineers of India. <coughs> For that, we are also getting money from the ministry, government. You see, we have been here for such a long time. The very young probationers who just got into service come and spend some time here. So now, youngsters who came here now, Indian ambassador to France was one of the youngsters now, who came here in 1976. Wow. Indian ambassador to South Africa, 
him as a probationer to Thelonia. The Secretary of the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, Government of India, was a youngster who came here in 40 years ago. So we've got people who've been in and out of this place 40 years ago. And they're all very senior bureaucrats or diplomats or... And so, if they help, you want to walk in there, they know that you're not there for anything but for the community. So, short circuits are processed by six months. Yeah. Files move a bit faster, you know. So, <coughs> it helps to know the right people at the right time, at the right place. And we always think that Gandhi's message is still alive. Very few places in India are still alive, and one of them is here. And we try and see that we maintain it. Work style and lifestyle of Mahatma Gandhi is very alive in the Barefoot College. We think it's, he has a universal message. Cannot be destroyed, cannot be compromised, cannot be negotiated. You stick to the principles. Hmm? Stick to the principles. Can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. I noticed that from your bathrooms. You know, when we went in there, it's like, wow, this is one of the cleanest we've seen. <laughs> so, wow. thank you for that. <laughs> Rosemary is our bathroom specialist. She yes, just, I just <laughs> picture the we moved into. Wow. That's new. Even the tree. <laughs> so I must have been the bugbear of these. <laughs> big shop, big problem. That shockingly dirty toilet. Big problem. No concept at all. No concept at all. We are really, very really poor in hygiene. That's true. Are there countries you're interested in getting into that you haven't been to yet? We look. Oh, no. Sorry. We look at. The United Nations has made a list of the least developed countries. And there are 47 of them. And when we wanted to go abroad to promote the barefoot model, we looked at the last country on that list and worked ourselves up. Oh, wow. <clears throat> we must be the only community-based organizations that has covered over 40 of those 47 countries. Grandmothers from everywhere. What was that country that was the first on the bottom of the list? Sierra Leone. Syria? Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone. Oh, Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone. Yeah. So we went to Sierra Leone and we selected four grandmothers from Sierra Leone in 2008. And we brought them here and took them back and they solar electrified the first village of Sierra Leone. <coughs> 2010, the Minister of Education for Sierra Leone was driving back to Freetown and he saw this village had light in the middle of darkness everywhere. He went into the village and he said, what's the story? Mm -hmm. And the village said, these two grandmothers. And the Minister of Education was totally mystified. He said, what do you mean these two grandmothers? They went to India and came back. Mm -hmm. And they solar electrified their village. Wow. Butau? Butau? So the minister said, uh, what happened? They said, oh, this strange bunker in his pajamas came and took us to India. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he came back. <laughs> So the minister went to the president <coughs> and said, do you know there's a solar electrified village in Freetown, <laughs> in, in Serbia? Next day, half the cabinet went to see them. Yeah. The grandmother they said, what? So on January 2011, I was summoned by the president of Serbia. When the president summons you, you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I went there. And he said, can you train me some more grandmothers? I said, I'm so sorry, Mr. President, I can't train you grandmothers, but if you build me a barefoot training center in Sierra Leone, maybe we could do something together. So he built me the first barefoot training center at $800,000. Wow. 
in Sierra Leone. And now we are training 50 grandmothers at a time in that barefoot training center. Wow. And we are not training. <coughs> it's the woman who came first to the barefoot college became the trainer, Nancy Kanu. She is now called Lady Kanu, if you please. <laughs> and when we went to inaugurate it in 11, February 2011, he inaugurated, the president inaugurated the center, I was there. And Nancy Kanu spoke to 5,000 people who had come for the first Barefoot Training Center. And the president turned to me and said, she's going to be trouble. I said, yes, Mr. President, she's going to be trouble. <laughs> That's the way it works. Minister. She's going to be the next minister, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so Lady Kanu now has persuaded the government to install 5,000 units at $1.6 million. And we just got the order. Lady Kanu. Imagine five mm -hmm. years ago, Lady Kano in the middle of a bush somewhere. <laughs> so mm -hmm. now she's Lady Nancy Kano. That's the story. So yeah. now we've gone up the list, and all the possible least developed countries around the world we have gone and selected grandmothers. Every grandmother is a walking, talking, barefoot college. So now the government of India has got very interested in this. So they've given me <coughs> money to start five barefoot training centers in Africa, each at $400,000. Sierra Leone, not Sierra Leone, Senegal, Burkina Faso, Liberia, South Sudan, and Tanzania. We're starting a barefoot training center in Fiji, starting one in Guatemala, Starting one in Zanzibar, so now I can suitably retire. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story of how the barefoot model reaches everywhere. So there are a few countries left out of the 47, and we should be getting there in another two years. Beautiful. So now I'm on the way to Botswana, I'm on the way to Vietnam, I'm on the way to Kenya. So we have collaboration with. It's a public-private partnership. So there are some people who say, you know, we have some business, business interests in some places. Can you solar electrify some villages around our factory or around our complex? We have no problem with that. So the government of India gives the money for them to come here. And this business house with very progressive CSR policies give the money for the equipment. So it's making sure that they have a very progressive CSR policy that's important as well. Yeah, otherwise yeah. they won't go to that. Exactly. So good. they have a good CSR policy. And uh, it's peanuts for them. To solar electrify one village, it's only about $50,000 or 100 houses. Wow. Nothing. That's amazing. Nothing. Wow. And for seven years they have light. Four hours of light every, for seven years. Technically and financially self-sufficient solar electrified villages in the world, that's the better part. No dependence on anybody, no dependence on the engineer, no dependence on outside. Everything is managed, controlled, owned by the community. Very Gandhi. Are these centers allowed to feed their surplus energy into the surplus <coughs> or do No, this is a decentralized model which is which is household level decentralization. The one you're talking about is someone who puts in a solar power plant and then feeds it into the grid. That is not very Gandhi. No, it isn't. But no, no. It, do the villages produce more than they require or they just produce? As much as they need. We don't want them to produce more. Basic light is a fundamental right. They have a very right to that. Basic, nowadays a basic right is to also charge a mobile or if you charge their mobiles with, <laughs> with solar. So that they don't have to walk five kilometers to charge their mobile. So all these are basic rights that we address. Television, we give them in a... <coughs> every house has, every village which is solar electrified has a rural electronic workshop <coughs> built into the model. 
and that has two years spare. So any major and minor repairs is carried out by the grandmother on the spot without any engineer. When I went to Peru and I had, um, met the head of the solar electrification department of the government, I said, look, I'll put 20 parts of the solar lamp in here and 20 parts here. Get your double PhD guy to put this together and I'll put my grandmother here and put it together. He said, the double PhD guy won't be able to do it. He won't be able to put the solar lamp in together because he's got only theory, no practice. Oh, wow. And the grandmother can do it in half an hour. And <laughs> <laughs> so who do you want? He said, no, I want the grandmother. I said, no, this guy's useless. What's he going to do? He's just Read pushing papers. Just pushing so, papers. So they have really changed the mindset of people when they've gone back home. Which is good. Yeah, please. When the, when the women first returned to their village, how did they get the funds to, for the supplies? For the <coughs> we negotiate the funds before the women come to India with some private foundation, with some philanthropic um, house. So we have uh, UN women giving money for the equipment. We have um, there's a very powerful private foundation called the Bar Foundation in Boston. They give us some money. Then we have a very powerful foundation called the Skoll Foundation in San Francisco. They give us some money. So all these arrangements are done before the woman comes, so that afterwards we know where the money comes from for the equipment. No training for training's sake. It has to have some effect in the bank. Goes into effect right away. <coughs> Sorry? By pre-planning it all, it, it, it goes into effect right away. Right. Boom, boom, boom. So there's no skip or loss, right? But we have hassles. <coughs> no customs duty. You have to pay customs. You have to get exemption. All these hassles come when the, when the equipment lands up in the seaport. Mm -hmm. All this stuff. Yes, sorry. Please interrupt. Uh, my question was similar about like what support you give to the women after they leave here. Like how? We always work through community-based organizations with a track record in that country. So we have about 68 organizations we are working with who have a track record in each country who are already working with villages and they have a presence there and people know them. So when we go there, we go with them so there's a certain amount of, um, there's no resistance because now they know these people. So we work through these NGOs in these places. So they are the ones who have to prepare the passports for these women. They have to get their medical to the women. We have to get the, fill up this elaborative form, very huge complicated form of the government yeah. and submit it to the embassy. The embassy then sends it to Delhi, Delhi sends it to me, saying, would you want to accept it? I said, yes. And it goes all the way back and then the, <coughs> then the etiquette is made. Not just like that. So, there's an elaborative process that has to be followed and there has to be an NGO who does all these things. Because some of them don't have records, some of them don't know, uh, you know, they don't have an identity card. So all these things have to be made. If they're very poor people, they just have no identity. Mm -hmm. So you have to make that, it takes a long time. A long time? How long? Six months? A year? Oh, no, no. Can't wait that long. So it has to be an NGO with some connections. So we get it within two, three weeks. Ah. Wow. <coughs> two, three weeks, the passport is made. Someone who knows, someone who knows, someone who knows, someone, you know, that's how it works. Yeah. If, you have, if you go to a very small NGO, they can't do it. If you go to a bigger NGO, they have the connections, they get the passport. All these are complications that you face when you choose the world. Governor has to be present. Oh, complicated. Is there any reason why you choose grandmothers? Yeah, because men are untrainable. Why <laughs> <laughs> men, why not mothers? Because you're a grandmother 35 in Africa. Oh, yeah. And you're a grandmother between 35 and 50, which is the best age. Mm -hmm. You're mature, you communicate, you're respected, you're, look, you're not looked down on because of age. All these factors have been taken into account. Grandmother sounds very sexy, actually. You know, they went so long. <laughs> grandmother, <laughs> 60 years old. I said, no, no, no. Grandmother. In Africa, it's 35. Wow. Everywhere in traditional societies, grandmothers are 35, 40, 45. 
you marry very young, you produce children very young. One grandmother from Guatemala came with 19 grandchildren. <gasps> mm. How she, she was very happy because her husband was having a hell of a rough time. <laughs> 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 and she was very pleased, she was happy. She was say, I said, I'm good. <clears throat> I get calls every week on, because everyone's given a mobile here. Yes. With a number. Mm -hmm. So they can ring up home anytime they want. If they feel homesick or someone's ill. So everyone has a mobile. The largest bill I have is a mobile bill. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to talk. Yeah. So I said, is your, is your husband happy? She said, no, she's not happy, but she's smiling away here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's having a hell of a rough time. They say, when are you coming back? I said, I'm six months. Yeah. Is the long-term goal is to create new training centers in these countries where the women are from, so, so that, that they don't have to bring them to India? Yeah. To, okay, and is that successful? To the you should see because the first barefoot training center is starting in February. Oh, in Zanzibar. Okay. Uh, it takes time for people to get it because you say the trainers will be the women who we've trained in India. You won't take any trainers from outside. It have to be someone who's been through India got the practical experience to be able to start. And the first one will be in February. South Sudan is just about to start. So we are very happy with South Sudan. Our partner there is Bishop Elias Taban, who is an extraordinary woman, a man in, who met at the Clinton Global Initiative in New York. Extraordinary. He's the guy who actually made the deal between North and South Sudan. And the, and the president was <coughs> president of South Sudan was very very adamant to do something with uh, South Sudan, North Sudan. And, uh, in fact, Mrs. Clinton was telling us how she uh, had written an article in the New York Times, and she put that article in front of the president, uh, President Kiir, in South Sudan. And President Kiir saw it and said, "Oh, this chap or this child so new." He was a child soldier, he became a bishop and he was a child soldier. He said, wow, that really changed. So he has a, he has a tremendous influence in South Sudan. So we went there, <coughs> set it up, wrote something up. The government is totally scared about going to South Sudan. I said, no, no, I'm very happy with South Sudan. They're saying there's a war going on there. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, there is a war, but not everywhere. <laughs> there's a war going up north, but you can't write out the country because there's a war going up north for oil. So, yeah, can't, can't even imagine us working in South Sudan in such difficult conditions. The UN has just totally closed their shop and not moving out. They're so scared. No one moves out of that campus. Mm -hmm. It's a huge campus, 300, 400 acres or something. Wow. wow. And no, one goes, no one moves out, they're so petrified. And here we're merrily going to Ye and flying down and it's good. Um, how do you balance like your international work versus like the local recruitment? We have an international wing coming up. <coughs> a diplomat from Colombia retired and joined us and he's based in Colombia. And he looks after America, South America, Central America. He does also the selection for us. He came in Syria for a couple of months with us, so he knew the philosophy of the college. <coughs> we have quite a few um, volunteers from the Clinton School in Arkansas who come here. In fact, there are two or three who come every year. We have a, and in return, I go and speak at the Clinton University there. So, there's a good deal. Every year, put in New York in September, the Clinton Global Initiative. So we make a lot of partnerships along the way. Some with your ideology, some not with your ideology. So you have to pick and choose. When you are old enough to be an organization with some strength, then you have the you have the space to choose who you want to work with. I won't work with Gates, I won't work with MacArthur, I won't work with Rockefeller because it's too big, too cumbersome and too bureaucratic and not worth it.